and welcome to Varm Blog. And today I'm with Mike Watson, the author of Why the Light Can't Meme and the Meming of Mara Fisher, and the author of an upcoming book. Would you like to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, the Meming of Mark Fisher, basically, the full title is The Meming of Mark Fisher, How the Frankfurt School Foresaw Capitalist Realism and What to Do About It. And I actually had to read that off my own copy here. Um, so basically, I, I would make it even short. I would make it a little bit shorter if I was to think of that now. But basically, the meaning of Mark Fisher and how the Frankfurt School foresaw capitalist realism, i.e. How, how a lot of his arguments in capitalist realism are kind of foreseen uh, by Adorno, Benjamin, and Marcuse. So um, why do you think... I, I think the meaning of Mark Fisher is kind of interesting as a concept. Um you know, uh, when I read your book, I, I had also been thinking about it because I, you know, I worked with Mark on a, on a couple articles. Um, the biggest one being the kind of infamous Vampire Castle one, but I, I, I know he had a long, you know, blogging career, which kind of made his, which kind of made you know capitalist realism in a way. I mean, he he came out of the K Punk blog, and then. Um, through that and through that getting him some gigs at the guardian got a, you know became one of the founding members of the original crew of zero books and um sort of the rest is history um but i i've always liked mark's work but i thought it was i i, I also thought that everything he said was already said by the Frankfurt School, or Frederick Jameson, or you know something that was about ten years, ten to forty years earlier. So, um, well, that's for sure. Yeah, and I, I think he would have said that. I also worked with him a bit. I did a a couple of articles with him, and I had him in Italy, in Rome, where I used to live. Mm -hmm. I ran a conference on alternative education, and he visited, and we we hung out a bit. And of course, there's many people who've hung out with him because he was very generous hung out with him online or in real life. Um, but he was someone who would, uh, sorry, there's some sirens in the background there. You're getting that. Uh, he, he was someone who would um, hang out with people who weren't as established as him, which was one of the great things about him. Um, and yeah, I think he, he was aware of his, his indebtedness to those figures, although he didn't really mention the Frankfurt School in any depth in capitalist realism. They get a couple of very brief mentions but in acid communism, he goes into an in introduction, which we which we have because uh, the introduction is out there. He didn't get further than the introduction, I don't think, uh, before he took his life. Um, he goes into Marcuse and Adorno, and it looks like the whole book will kind of be very much around Marcuse's idea of the great refusal. So it would have been kind of very interesting to see uh, what came about there. But but the, the title of my book, The Meming of Mark Fisher, is because he's become a meme. Mm -hmm. um, not Literally. Yeah, uh, and it's incredible because he's become something quite different to what he was, uh, I think. And, you know, there are some quite ridiculous takes on Fisher. And then, you know, just he's become a product of the algorithms that he's been co-opted by effectively capitalism when that's what he wrote about in Capitalist Realism. He, he wrote about the co-opting of culture, of left culture by capitalism. So it's kind of an awkward situation because, of course, you want kids to get into Fisher through memes, uh, sometimes I think people definitely get turned on to Fisher by memes, but at the same time, a lot of the stuff is very cringeful. So I, I do go into that and that kind of that, you know, that thing where the Internet's like the best thing that's ever happened to us and the worst thing. And you're about the same age as me. So you'll feel that, I think, um, because the 80s and 90s were kind of dull in some respects. So now you have this tool, which is great, but also it's obviously negative in many ways. So I'm addressing that. Some people have kind of got upset about the fact there could be a book on Fisher and memes, but I won't go into that in any detail. But that's basically why I'm doing it, because I'm not really upset, but I also find it, you know, kind of awkward. I think we need to go into this a bit. So I talk about that and how we can use the Internet effectively with Fisher's thought and with the thought of the Frankfurt School. So... One of the things about the Frankfurt School is I think uh, its ability to comment on the internet has kind of been hampered by the fact that the successors of of Adorno, Marcuse, and uh, um, uh, <laughs> uh, Horkheimer have not taken it up in, in the way that one would expect. I mean, um, 
I have a pretty dour opinion on Haber, on Habermas. I don't have a super high opinion on Axel Hanef. Um, uh, Raymond Geist is, I think, still probably in that original lines thought, but has not been that influential outside of a very kind of niche um, part of the humanities. Um, why do you think that, you know... Um, I haven't seen a lot of scholarship like applying Adorno to memes, um, which does seem like something that would have been right up Adorno's alley in a kind of negative way. You feel that he would have been writing about them. Yeah. Um, I actually had somebody from a very big journal or their panel, you know, when you, you like tell a journal, you want, you want to write something and they say, can I see some of it or can I see it? And I actually responded back that memes are a worthy topic of philosophical discussion, but Adorno isn't the right scholar. And I've basically done a whole you know, essay on Adorno and um, memes. And I kind of replied that, hey, that's kind of, you know, thank you for your feedback, but I'm just about to release a book on Adorno and memes. So, you know, <laughs> uh, not particularly welcome feedback. Um, and yeah, there is this kind of snobbery, I suppose. You get it also on some of the Adorno forums. There's the Adorno Studies Forum on Facebook, and some of the, uh, the guys who run it are actually kind of nice enough guys, but sometimes they, they appear kind of like gatekeepers of Adorno, and a lot of the people who speak on it get very upset if you make Adorno memes or you, you write about Adorno and memes. Um, I think Adorno, I mean, is him and Benjamin and Horkheimer, they really kind of... Uh, they opened something up in terms of philosophical study. They were great popularizers in a way of philosophy because they were applying it to things that hadn't been applied to. And I think it's a shame we're not looking at it in that way uh, anymore. And of course, Adorno, you know, he wrote in fragments in Minima Moralia. He wrote in these short, uh, polemic type paragraphs. Uh, it's a whole book of, I think, 157 or so. Um, you know, short texts, and he kind of felt that you might get closer to the truth because we live in a fragmented society, so we need a kind of fragmented approach theoretically, and that kind of is what memes are. And then so many of his statements in his books that aren't specifically fragments are also fragments. He just wrote in this way where he kind of goes from one topic to the next topic. It's kind of a dialectical argument but with these different themes playing off against each other. And those things, those fragments get, get taken out of, of the context and made into memes. So this thing of like, you can't make poetry after Auschwitz has become a meme. Mm -hmm. So sure. I think whilst we, I think we both agree that he'd probably have some pretty negative takes on, on memes. I don't know how much he's opposed really at a formal level. Well, one of the interesting things about, about memes that I think Adorno would, would have a lot to say about, and that the left has had a hard time understanding how to utilize in the same way is the kind of meta meta irony i mean like i, I use meta meta as almost because there's there are multiple le levels of ironic meta taxes that that like completely removes a, a meme from its original context and usually um it's or it might be there but it's there in like a hint Whereas the the discourse around the meme and the way the memes become re referential to themselves take on a whole new life, and what's what's interesting about this from the standpoint of Adorno or, or Benjamin is that it's it's mechanically reproduced, so that authenticity is not there, but it's not really part of an industry in the same way, or it kind of is becoming so, but it didn't start out that way. It was like a reappropriation of of industrial like of the cultural industry's own detritus you know um so if you look at like how the memes initially kind of emerged it was you would use i mean initially it was i you know if we go into deep history of the internet which albeit is only 20 years old but it would have been like ironic commentary on cat photos which then led to reappropriations of anime and pop culture which themselves be started to replace the cat photos etc 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 and the discourse around this you know i am we, a lot of ado is made about the chan boards but it also comes out of like live journal culture and and a lot of stuff that's kind of 
from that period of the internet that's really between the very early message board, you know, pre World Wide Web internet and the, you know, highly commercialized Web 2.0, where the internet's much more of a commercial product than maybe is the commercial cultural product now. Um, do you agree with that or do you have a opposing take or? Um, I, uh... I think it's very tricky. I think this is this goes back into it being one of the best and worst thing that ever happened to us. Um, and I think that that comes down from from Marx's argument in Capital, which is often overlooked. That capitalism, you know, is is positive in many respects. That it gives us the tools to realise equality, but then that that isn't what happens with it. Um, I think the internet is a lot like that. I think it, you know, it depends how how much one can really separate out. An activity opposed to capitalism from the platform it occurs on, which is, you know, deeply capitalist. And I think it more and more feels that there's no corner of the internet that isn't capitalist. Um, I don't really explore the dark web so much, so I don't really know. I mean, there must be forms you can use the internet in which doesn't, which don't feel, don't feed in to to algorithms. But it's such a small um, kind of segment of the internet that that's not really you, know, you can't really say that the internet is not capitalist or there are, there are non-capitalist applications that can really affect society um i don't know because obviously adorno talks a lot about autonomy of our the autonomy of art virtually mm. not existing uh in the 40s to 60s and and that being a result of art being co-opted by capitalism but he kind of leaves open this, you know, bourgeois autonomy, and that's why he looks for kind of freedom or some kind of notion of a free subjectivity in classical music, abstract music, literature, and and and, and things like that, forms like that that aren't um, as commercial as cultural industry products. But today, I don't know. I mean, I don't want to say what Adorno would think because Adorno is just not here. But you know, if we're going to use that same kind of framework, is there a use of the internet that that kind of separates itself out from the cultural industry? um pretty much not but then i think it partly it partly um comes down to what people think they're doing when they're when they're online i think i think you have to think at some point you know somebody thinks they're doing something that's free as in sense of freedom mm -hmm. um or they think they think they're making a free choice at some point we have to go along with that because what is a free choice other than or what is a choice other than you know when you think you've made a choice right um so, you know, I think at least there's people online doing stuff where they feel removed out of the culture industry. Like we're having a conversation now, how much do we feel inevitably kind of drawn back into the culture industry? You know, it, because if, if we, if we, you know, if we go down the road of everything we do is doomed to kind of, you know, feedback into Amazon, Facebook, etc. What's the point in all this chat? You know? No, that is a good question. I mean, um, one wonders, and maybe this is a good place to pivot about some of the other implications that you've been thinking about. What is the point of all this chat? I mean, kind of small careers around the scraps of the culture industry have been established. And But if you actually look at, like, you know, what is the average, per, like, what does a mid to top tier YouTuber earn on political commentary? You know, um, yes, there are people doing box, um, you know, like uh, unboxing videos that can bring in hundreds of thousands a year. But I think most most of the people I know who are in the YouTube sphere who are successful are still making on the low end of uh, uh, of what you would consider a, a, a quote, middle class income, unquote. You know, very yeah, few people are Chapo Chap House or anything like that. There's some people who are kind of famous even outside our our kind of field that aren't making money to live off from mm -hmm. from YouTube podcasts, etc. So you're right there, yeah. Um, it's not so much, I suppose, whether we're, whether we're making money, but what we're but making someone's does making feed money. back into the algorithms, and you know, it's part of the capitalist system in that respect. Well, um, it is interesting, like just looking at podcast, Mike, because like I, I point this out a lot, but like 10 years ago, all the podcasts were libertarian and now they really are almost all left. But um, has that changed much? It doesn't feel like it. 
I mean, has it changed much on a kind of macro level? Yeah, beyond beyond the left's own discourse towards itself. I don't know. I mean, it depends how much you think things changed because there was Bernie Sanders and Jeremy Corbyn. I mean, it kind of changed the Overton window, but only the Overton window, if that can, if that can happen. You know, it mm -hmm. changed the dialogue, but the economics haven't really changed. Um, I mean, there's definitely a lot more people on podcasts saying really left things in a, in a kind of socialist, communist sense. I don't know, because some of it's just so very academic. Um, and it's really just kind of pouring over, over Marx and other similar thinkers. Um, I suppose Marx was also an activist of sorts. Yeah, although that's um, not what people are looking at. Like when you ask people to look at what Marx did versus what Marx wrote, it's hard to get people to engage. I maybe because you know it's it's it, that's just not as readily accessible. You can't just you know find you know the life of Marx and well, you actually kind of can, but um, <laughs> you you can't find the life of Marx in a way that presents it in correlation with what he was writing about when in an easy way, it's like broken up over hundreds of books. Um, as someone yeah, who's been trying I mean, to it, do that, it's it comes really down hard. a lot to, yeah, you see a lot of his speeches, but, but, but it doesn't really give you the feel of, you know, where he was speaking, why he was speaking. It, those, those are presented in an academic sense, what are read in an academic sense. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I don't know. I, I've been saying for a long time on the acid left, the podcast I run with, um, Adam Ray Adkins, that people need to get off off the internet and and join their local whatever group. I mean, it could be um, how do you call these people? DSA. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how you, what you think of them. I'm just I'm just putting that out of the air because you're in America. But um, or it could be Labour, or it could be Black Lives Matter. But we need to be encouraging people to do that if we're going to get people to like sit and watch us and listen to us. I think we have a responsibility to also say, you know, get out there. But then I, I do wonder how many of the podcasters are getting out there and joining local groups and doing stuff like, you know, grassroots stuff in real life. Because my feeling is they're not, but I don't know, because maybe they're just not saying that they're doing that kind of activity. It's hard to gauge even as someone who 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 does this. Um, I... Um... I was involved in uh, immigration activism up until COVID. But one of the things I will say about a lot of this is there is a real sense in which COVID has changed the dynamics. And some of the people who were more involved in person and real tangible political and community sort of things have become more uh, tied to the the commentary sphere just because a lot of the other things aren't do, aren't. And I have trouble figuring out how to um, do anything right now. Um, a, another impetus that, that we've seen is ironically, a lot of the money for this stuff and does require money. Um, not so much in the DSA, but in, in, in like things that were peripheral activist uh, uh, groups locally has dried up because it was attached. A lot of the funding was kind of backdoor attached to NGOs and things that were, even if the 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 people doing the activists weren't part of the NGO, that's where their some of their money was coming from. And when Trump went away, so did a lot of that money. Um, it's it's a dynamic in the U.S. I don't think has really been dealt with that much. Um, the DSA doesn't have the same problem because it wasn't as dependent on NGO money. Um, so you know. This is all very micro level for someone not in the U.S., but it is kind of a dynamic you have to look at. Um, so I guess I would say they probably aren't now, even if they were. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I see that. I mean, I wonder also, wouldn't they be telling us that they are involved in activist politics if they if they were? I, I would know. hope. I mean, I would... I would hope they'd at least be telling people to join their organization. But a lot of people, when you talk to a lot of people like in the DSA, like even those in it don't totally believe in it, which is a kind of strange. Yeah. You know, but I suppose phenomenon. you're in it, to, you're, maybe you're in it to change it. Mm. Perhaps. I mean, there, I mean, I left the labor party in the UK recently, but I actually live in Finland. So me leaving the labor party isn't how it might sound because I mean, I mean the, what's called Vazimisto or the left Alliance in Finland, which is one of the more left parties in Finland. 
um, who have people in their cabinet. They have an edu education minister and health minister, um, mm. so they're in government, but they only poll, I think, 10 to 15 percent in in major elections. Um, but if the left, if the Social Democrats get in, they tend to give seats or, sorry, cabinet positions to the left alliance, the party I'm in. So I am in this party and I get involved in meetings. And I run the basically the international team in our local town, which only has a few people in it. But we talk about, you know, how to get across foreigner issues mm -hmm. and immigration issues. Um, but, you know, I've been very attached to Labour and I campaign online for Labour. I campaigned online for Corbyn to win in 2019. There's some videos on Zero Books, actually, of me talking about Corbyn. Um, but I left the party because it's just got ridiculous. They chucked out... Um, now, how can I forget his name? The famous filmmaker who's over 80 years old. Anyway, um, they chucked him out of the party recently because they're basically purging uh, Corbynites, prominent Corbynites. Um, so I just said that's enough because I'm paying like $50, $60 in US dollars a year to these people and they're behaving abysmally, you know, the Labour Party at the moment. So I thought it was time to go. Um, but, you know, a lot of people said, well, you should stay. And Jeremy Gilbert who uh, did some work with Fisher as well, who's a kind of well-known writer in his own right, said to me on Twitter that you need to stay and fight or people should stay and fight. I can kind of see that. I can see that with, with the DSA that maybe it's not to anyone's liking and maybe it's just lots of people who don't really like what's happening, pushing in different directions. But they might, you know, they, maybe they should stay to try and make it what they want it to be. I would, I would say that... Uh... I'm not in the DSA because my, but it's actually a local chapter issue. I just, uh, my local chapter and I don't get along. Um, but, um, and I have trouble with the idea of indirectly giving money to Democrats. Um, however, I'm in a union, which means I'm still doing that. Uh, so um, the, uh, but I would not tell people to leave right now um, unless they really felt they had to, because I mean, I do think this is a, a, a kind of a conscience moment. You have to decide um, if you're going to try to work within an organization and change it, or if you're going to try to posit a new organization. But most of the people who leave don't have any way to posit something alternative to it. Um, and and that's not just true with the DSA. That's also the way we've been with the with the Democratic Party in the U.S. And unlike European parties, there's no cost to being in the Democratic Party. I mean, it's like something you just declare. Um, when you go register to, you know, to get your car and you register the vote in most states, you, you, you are strongly encouraged to pick a party so you can vote in a primary and then that's it. It's done. There's, it's actually something that I don't think, uh, people understand, like it would be hard for the Democrats to purge their ranks outside of elected officials because, it's such an ephemeral membership in the in the first place. You know, it's not like labor in that sense. Um, you mm -hmm. don't pay anything to be a Democrat. Um, so it's it's yeah, also but, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I get that, but also you have I think more tiers in a way, more mm -hmm. levels. Um, so one doesn't have to feel that they're they're effectively supporting Biden by being the Democrats. No. Well, I I would say I would say what what you have in the in the United States Democratic Party, and this is something that we we may disagree on, but we do have to look at right. Um, is that what would happen in a spectrum of multiple parties in another country, because of the structure of U.S. law, kind of has to be within parties, um, in the U.S. Um, but the the ability, like, like, oh my God, I don't know what we would do in the United States if, if if a centrist Democrat appointed a real cabinet member from from the from the DSA sphere. Like, I don't, I think, I think people might actually like fall over with joy and almost become dysfunctional if that happened. Um, and and um, it is interesting because. If you look at U.S. law, it's theoretically way more possible for that to happen than it is for, say, a third party to really replace the the Democrats in any major political um, but political sphere. It's just uh, we're so confederated as a country, and the parties, while they're not formalized at a national level, actually, they are at a at a state level. Like they're officially kind of a quasi part of government, even though they're 
they're technically private corporations. Um, it's it's kind of a. Uh, I, I think it's interesting to talk to Europeans about because in some ways um, the American system is both obvious to them because, you know, you see all our news, you have to deal with our crap all the time. There's no way around it. Um, but also not entirely apparent because a lot of the things we do work so differently than parliamentary party systems. And so you're right. You could be in the Democrats and not be part of the Bidenist agenda, uh, but it's also unclear what you can really do about the if you're in the Democrats and not part of that agenda. It's 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 kind of a it's it's kind of a hard sell right now because the DSA, while it does have a lot of of like almost 100,000 people, which yes, in a country of 330 million is not nearly as much as you'd like, but it's more than any other left group has had in the United States since the 1910s. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, it, it's, it's also unclear, however, like how it could actually form counter institutions to like, even within the Democrats to the DSA, just because the funding is not there. Um, and it's not that the DSA doesn't have money, but when you, like, you start looking at what it costs to do electoral stuff in the United States at the national level, you're dealing in millions and billions of dollars. Um, so, but yeah, I would still tell they got it. People need to join something if, if, if only to discipline themselves to doing more than commentary. Yeah, I mean, there's, yeah, it doesn't have to be a party. It could be there's an organization in, in the US. I think it might be like Florida or around there, uh, Mums for Housing or Moms for Housing. I don't know if you heard about mm -hmm. uh, these people who basically campaign for obviously around housing issues. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe they, maybe they're not, they're not just in Florida. Certainly, they are in Florida. Uh, partly, I don't know if they're elsewhere. There are similar movements, similar groups in in London. The E15 campaign for housing. E15, because that's a postcode area where they where they started. Um, I mean, these kind of things are very concrete, so to speak. You can see how that's kind of affecting things directly. We can all kind of see gentrification, how that kind of works. So that's something people can get involved in. Obviously, immigration is one. Um, ecology, green issues is always obviously important, but I think that people tend to forget the the capitalism or so much of the green debate doesn't talk about economics, bizarrely. Um, but anything, any way people can get involved. I mean, it's surprising that, that, that people around us are not encouraging people more to like get out and do stuff. But I think also that has to happen post... Uh, post lockdown i don't know what's happening in the us right now but you know there are kind of stages of being post lockdown and then things get kind of brought back in in finland they just kind of brought in more measures in helsinki um but you know on, on the whole we look like we're getting out of lockdown so there's going to be people who are young who didn't maybe get the full university experience who are going to be kind of agitated maybe they didn't get their mm -hmm. socialization experience as they would have done they could be even uh, prior to uni at high school that they're going to feel aggrieved a bit and they still want to do their socialization with drug taking and drinking and what have you. Not that that's essential, but you know, there's going to be that. And I think a number of unemployed people who are going to be angry and people say there's this economic miracle coming or already arrived, but I think that's nonsense. I think that's only for certain segments of society. So I think we will see an aggrieved unemployed and student population coming together and they should do but it's how you know how do we get involved in that because actually that looks like it's going to go far more down the right-wing populist route yep um but you know the, it remains that we have this kind of broadcasting capacity there's a number of left-wing broadcasters of different sizes and we could be like directing people you know that the sanders and the corbyn campaigns had this process of having these um forums uh yeah. on things on, on on apps like slack where they would say to people go and campaign in this area and also make a meme and also phone a friend and tell them to vote democrat or sanders or whatever um and i think we could be doing that you know with the broader broader left movement with the grassroots left movement we could be saying we need some street carnival here we need someone to go and talk to old ladies over here we need someone to go to the supermarket here and talk to people 
and we need a few more memes on this topic and that could be global mm. it wouldn't be that difficult to coordinate something like that so that's kind of where i get at the end of this book the memeing of mark fisher um but i'm not i'm not i, I mean i don't know what that would take Te technologically i think it's quite it's quite simple actually why well, kind of put it out there so i'm not sure i'd be the one who's making a platform but i think we could do that for example i've actually kind of wondered why during the age of the internet um the focus on the left has become more national actually than it even was when we had less power um our and by power i mean less people um what <clears throat> Like in the United States, you are finally the DSA is finally beginning to like really start looking at um, the U.S.'s relationship to the Latin American left. And while they have sometimes made decisions that I have found to be naive, um, uh, they are at least trying to engage there. Um, they've always kind of engaged with the European left until actually until recently because that was what our in the United States mind, th those were our, like, those were the more successful people that we needed to model ourselves on. I think until the burning, the Bernie Corbin losses and now um, sanguinity about the European left has declined rapidly. Um, you know, for example, I think all Marxists used to know what was going on in, in, in the British left. Like that was where we thought that we were going to get our models from. Um, and in the last two years, we don't care anymore. And then even in the, even like zero books, which started out as a UK press, it was very UK focused at first, US focused. You know, I can tell you without you know without breaking policy that that we've been told even by our by our owners that like our future's in the US now, um, and that's that's a big change. Um, so I think it's, I think it's interesting because we're not seeing the international coordination. And I actually think for once, like the, the, the British left could probably use our help, um, be, because the purging after Corbyn seems to have left people completely unsure what to do. Yeah. Um, they, they were looking to, they were looking to Sanders before, like the, the whole idea of what, what is called dispersed organization mm -hmm. came from the Sanders campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, this kind of online in real life hybrid um and they're still looking to to sanders it's true um it was ken loach who got kicked out of the party that's what i meant to mm -hmm. say um, yeah, that seems kind of, ridiculous to me <laughs> yeah i mean it, it, 80 year old neorealist cinema maker making films basically you know saying be good to each other and gets kicked out it was a provocation really which in a way makes makes it bad that I left, but of course, as I said before, I'm in Finland, so you know I have to weigh up: am I going to pay two party memberships, and one of them is for a party that is basically going back to to, to being neoliberal or third way? Um, so yeah, I don't think there's much hope there, and, and Britain's yeah, I mean it has this two party system as well, and if you look at how the constituencies of the regions are kind of divided up, I don't think there's much hope for a left labor i mean you, you can't have a breakaway situation you have a you have an a party or a party a group within labor called the socialist campaign group who have mm -hmm. about 30 seats in parliament but there's 600 seats in parliament in total from both parties 600 plus so it's that's really small and it's getting smaller but if they broke away they would just have nothing they probably wouldn't get seats basically so this is the problem we that's why corbyn's not leaving basically um so Britain's, yeah, certainly not a place to look to. I don't know what. I think Scandinavia maybe still. Um, but that's, you know, that's the, all very Sweden's pragmatic. having a kind of right-wing political crisis right now too, though. Um, but, yeah. but I mean, Sweden is also the, uh, the people in America who don't know. Sweden is the odd man out of the Scandinavian countries a lot of the times. But still, I, I'm, I'm having a, um, a, a comrade from Sweden come and try to explain it. Um, okay. One thing I, I will say that I've tried to use this online uh, online forum for is to get people just better educated about the lefts of other part of the world right now and to try to think about how one could have a positive orientation without 
being either a rube or a state department tool so i guess a rube or a different kind of rube um and um the one thing I, I realized that you need a lot more cultural literacy in the US. I mean, hegemons of empire, we could see this in the UK too. Like the, in your hegemonic moment, you can be really lazy. Um, you know, I, I remember like if you read like British stuff from the 50s or, or the 20s, they don't seem to know much about the world, even though they're ruling it. And similar in the United States, right? Um, uh, and I don't say that as like any kind of nationalist thing, but it's just something that you see about about imperial powers whereas like you you talk to people in the kind of periphery areas of europe or um or uh latin america they tend to know po everybody's politics like much better and they, they tend to follow they tend to be more educated on a lot of the, on a lot of other countries issues because i guess it <clears throat> more immediately affects them um so <clears throat> excuse me um the uh it seems to me that like one of the things we could be doing with this meme cultural force is trying to help with that because our problems are not national, they're international. Like, yeah, I mean, I, I think part of this is, I mean, how reasonable is it to have like docent or teacher figures in this space? Because that's kind of, you know, the, the, the gain of the internet. And it's actually where, Fisher grew up on K-Punk and a number of other bloggers at the same time grew up because, you know, you didn't have to be a professor to get recognized. And Fisher wasn't a professor. He was teaching. It's, it gets very confused when you read Fisher in, in capitalist realism because he's writing in English and the English system is different to the American system, or at least the terminology is different. So he was teaching in a college when he wrote mm -hmm. capitalist realism, but a college is a high school in england right right right. so he didn't have a a university teaching position until a bit later um and other people either didn't have or they were in departments where they weren't getting much kind of like um interaction from colleagues they were kind of the joke of the department like graham Harmon, the object-oriented guy was in cairo american university of cairo and no yeah. one in his department really understood this object-oriented stuff so I these remember. people looked for like other networks and they got the networks and people who were also maybe disillusioned with their own university students who couldn't talk to their professor because back then you know it was, it was worse than it is now like you often couldn't speak to your professor outside questions at the end of class because there was this kind of divide certainly in the uk they were kind of you know finding they could speak to mark fisher or graham Harmon, but they couldn't speak to the possibly less well-known professor at their uni um so this mm -hmm. kind of really opened stuff up but, you know, it opens stuff up so much. We get to a point now where, you know, it's really kind of bad practice to be like the professor in the forum or to point out that you are literally a teacher or professor. Um, Generation Z now, they really think, you know, anyone has an equal right to say anything. So that kind of, you know, that that's very challenging for somebody who's who's, you know, done stuff. You know, I kind of love that situation, but I also think, well, it's a bit difficult because, you know, I think that, okay, when you're 18 to 25, maybe 18 to 30, early 30s, you're often kind of introverted. Okay, I still am, but you're introverted to a different level where you might actually be openly hostile to, you know, it's a stupid thing to say, but to, to going down to the church fate and talking to the elderly people there, for example, because the whole thing just, you know, I'm still probably hostile to doing that, but, you know, there's just something that sucks about community, about things associated with family, about lots of things, you know, about bourgeois niceties, even when they're actually working class niceties. Um, you're insular and you, you're kind of hostile to social processes. And I get that, but I, I think that, you know, where that's happening and where a lot of the online left are quite young, which is great that they're getting into it, they're also, like, actually a against you know and actually innately against going out and forming community right and totally people who are a bit older could be people could, who are a bit older could be saying well come on people we need to go and form community that's where you'd be playing the role of the docent and being kind of reasonable but i don't know i mean to what extent can that can, can we do that how does one do that um i don't know it's a tricky i know um, it's it's harder because it's not to get all technologically doomerist on on people but um 
the reason why I think a lot of the Zoomers or Z uh, Generation Z are hostile to community is because their relationship to technology mediating social relations is to the point that when you remove the technology mediation, they feel crippling anxiety um, and and feel threatened. And I find that interesting actually because um, as a teacher, I've taught now for, for 15 years. And so I've taught two, gen you know, examples of two generational cohorts in the United States. Um, and I come out of another one um, myself and we were vicious in high school. Um, and these kids aren't, they really aren't in person. They're really, they're really kind of like nice. And I can't, they're vicious on the internet. Um, they're really, really kind in person, but they're afraid an overgeneralization, but I think COVID is going to make this even worse. They're afraid of person to person interaction, like profoundly. Um, I, I, an example of that even goes down to like, you know, I have students who tell me they have trouble turning on their Zoom camera because it makes them anxious um, when they when they're doing Zoom work. Now, uh, our lockdown situation is very different in the United States, depending which state you're in. And where I'm at, we're basically not locked down at all. Um, uh, but a lot of students have still opted out of uh, in-person education and, and this and the other. Um, and the and the students who have gone to in-person education, I said it's so different that they they still feel like they're not getting what they would have. And of course they're not. Like, how could you? Um, so I do think you're seeing a lot of this backlash. And, and then in, in the U.S., it's something that I'm beginning to see people talk about more. But it is actually a lot of working class people, not just um, diehard conservative ideologues who are beginning to resent the lockdowns, the mass mandates and the vaccine. Um, uh, and I think part of that comes from the fact that here they've also worked through this the entire time in some cases, like they've, ne some people have never not been exposed during this entire, uh, scenario. And while they've lost people, it becomes like, well, why aren't you also exposed to the same threat I am? And why should I trust you on your answer? Um, and while I think that's maladaptive, I don't think it's good, um, I can't necessarily say that I don't understand why people might develop those opinions. Um, so it, it, and uh, the left in America doesn't know how to talk to that because we also want to be seen as backing science, but we're, we're, this is one issue that's been turned into a cultural war issue. That's making it very hard for the U S left to seem like it actually engages with working class people even more than it already did. Um, and I don't know if that's happening in Europe in the same way, uh, but it's definitely happening here because three months ago, if you asked me who was an anti-vaxxer, I would have told you it was a conservative ideologue and that's still true, but you've actually seen the sentiment spread far beyond that. Yeah. I mean, there's a number of issues there. I mean, I suppose that firstly, yeah, I do kind of appreciate the difficulty for younger people. I, I've taught, um, millennials and generation z uh mm -hmm. zoomers z however you want to say it um yeah and yeah i appreciate that i mean there, there is this this issue of technology yeah but i'm kind of on the cusp of um gen x millennial and so are you i think um so i had a situation when i was teaching i mean i teach visiting lecturing now but i was um, adjunct in two american unis in italy i study abroad unis mm -hmm. and i had a thing where I couldn't like, I was right between my students and my superiors because my superiors were like 17 years older than me and my students were 17 years younger or something, something like this when I first started. Me too. And yeah. I didn't really feel Gen X or millennial. And I think some Zoomers were maybe just coming through when I stopped teaching there. Um, I had a lot to do with your socialization process. Like were you online largely when you started socializing independently of your family, like as a young, young adult or you know late teens? Um, and I was on like MSN Messenger and phone texting for some of this period. So I kind of feel some affinity with with uh, millennials. But I think there's a slightly different issue. There is that, but there's also like generational issues. Like, is it really right? No, yeah, maybe it's not generational. What I mean is age cohorts, as in like, you know, between 18 and 25, you will behave like this. And you will have behaved like that, whether you were Gen X or millennial or Zoomer. 
there are some issues which are kind of transcendent. Um, certainly they're affected by your generation, but there's also kind of issues of like your 18 you look at the world you don't know history that well and you think well everyone just basically fucked up but maybe i'll know better because you think you know you're just, you're not yet aware that maybe you're just not you know a genius you know of exceptional capability who's going to be able to save the world so you know i think we're all pretty narcissistic um well at any age we have those elements but when you're younger maybe you're like i'm not going to read the whole of marx because he probably says the same thing in page one that he says at the end of capital one uh, capital mm -hmm. volume one or even capital volume three and it's a bit like that but maybe as you get older you think well the answers aren't coming you know as things aren't quite working and i'm not like proving to be the genius i thought i was so i'm gonna have to read the whole of marx capital one um or whatever all three if you want i've only finished capital one myself um but i think it's similar with socializing as well i think there's just some kind of um dislike of community and the assumption that many people are stupid which comes a, comes across a lot in internet forums yeah and yeah for yeah, sure it doesn't come up doesn't come across in the classroom classroom at all i agree people in the classroom are generally very polite and actually i wonder why they're not as sarcastic as we were when, when i was at uni and, and college and school um but um where am i going with this uh yeah i mean there are these issues but you see i mean i don't know how this is going to be broken down unless somebody who, who's older is able to say to somebody who's younger maybe you need to do it a bit more like this which i did a little bit when i was younger i should have done it more um i mean should there not be like leaders in this whole thing i mean they kind of are like because they're a popular older figures and, and younger figures online um but maybe you're not saying the right things quite then um i think you have a point about that i mean i think i mean not, not I, I i think there's a tendency in in the left in the united states to both overemphasize and also underemphasize the importance of generational differences so some people will pop up like bush cars and saw and just like no none of this generation stuff matters and you're just like well i mean the boomer as a generation was the richest gener in america this is actually unique to the united states was actually the richest generation across almost all class variants that ever existed in human history so it, it would matter um but with the zoomers and and, and uh or the, you know whatever we call this up and coming generation there is both a, a radical egalitarianism but yeah a hostility towards community um and i think you're right we need to be trying to help and guide because i mean you know uh helping guide these these uh kids in a lot of ways but we also have to prove that we have something to offer and i don't know that we've done that um you know and that's that's my sort of challenge i was thinking about um both in the centrist media and in like the left media in the united states we've been talking a lot about how like no one and any generational cohort or whatever really believes in u.s institutions anymore and and the centrist are, you know, crying about it. And like, that's the number one political problem that we have. And then I'm like, yeah, but that's true. And it is a problem. But have you addressed why no one actually trusts the institutions anymore? It's not just paranoia. Like there are reasons why they don't. And you would have to address that and not just whine about the fact they don't to actually, you know, begin to, mm. to at least, you know, even if you couldn't fix it, at least pointing out exactly what it was that people responded to step by step by step along the way and what we possibly even could have thought of differently. And then, you know, then you could say, OK, we can't, I can't fix it myself, but it is a legit problem. And I do think like this is where the cultural production to kind of tie it back to your work of the left is important um, because we shouldn't exist for our own sake. Like to just do this, to be a famous podcaster. Well, maybe don't be political then. Like if you just want to be a famous podcaster, do the box on opening thing or whatever you want to do. Like uh, talk about, you know, talk about, uh, talk about star Wars or something. It's probably not going to help you right now, but you know, yeah. um, do the cultural commentary, but without all the politics, because that would make you, and you're not really harming anyone by doing that. 
Um, you're not helping anyone either, but um, it's kind of a net neutral thing to do. Whereas I think if you do that as a political figure, but that's all you're really interested in is your, your career, then you actually really are harming people. Um, yeah. I mean, how, how much are these figures really taken seriously? You know, it's I don't a bit like know. artists. I mean, there are artists that are like newspaper artists mm -hmm. in the sense that they're in newspapers and they everyone knows them. Like Damien Hurst, who put the sharks in formaldehyde. But how much is he really respected by artists? He's more of a sensation. It's, I, I think that some, some left tubers are a bit like this. They're just huge and they say sensational and stupid stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone's really looking at them for answers. But I'm talking about people, you know, who have like hundreds of thousands of, of views yeah. per video. Oh, uh, yeah. Just, like, yeah. I mean, you can say names if you want. I was, wasn't going to say names. But, no, no, no. But um, I know exactly who you're talking about. And I cannot, you also see this. I think where you see this in a, the most distilled form is like the biggest Twitter accounts are the ones that say the most ridiculous stuff. And people don't realize that, like, well, probably about two thirds of the followers are hate following them. Like, yeah. and, but, but as far as building their clout, it doesn't matter that it's hate. Like, it's still clout. Like, um, and so it, it it has a set of perverse incentives, I think, and I think that's what you're getting at there. What yeah, I think I think as but on a certain level, it's more like kind of quirky um, hobbies like CB radio mm -hmm. or even early precursors to the internet. I forget how you call it. So it's bigger than in, in America. It's like a almost like a cable TV system, but it was like early into you know early. Oh, internet. like the bulletin board system. Yeah, this kind of thing, you know, that the, the people were into, geeks were into. It's a bit like that. I, I see broadcasting as a bit more like that. Um, but obviously, also, you know, I want I want people to think and, and, and to get engaged and maybe that some of the stuff we broadcast, me and Adam can help help change stuff. But, you know, we're at a point where the internet has that capacity for horizontalism, and that's the best mm -hmm. thing about it. But it's just not it's not dissolving the hierarchy effectively. It kind of dissolves it, but retaining the superstars. And it's not, it's not helpful because a lot of people are looking and going, you know, it could be me that's famous next, whether they be podcasters, whether they be people taking selfies or whatever. And there's no knowing who it's going to be, who's going to blow up. And that's deeply frustrating for a lot of people. So I think it's creating more antagonism um it would be better if it just became completely horizontal but then you have to accept that you might only get five viewers each right you know, which is something different but you know but i think there there's you, it could, there can emerge some kind of issue of quality so you might expect to get a few hundred a few thousand um which is kind of actually where some of us are, are at at the moment um but um well, you know anyway i'm kind of i'm losing the thread but what, what i mean to say is that is that I think it works best when you, you know, you really want to see the internet through to its ultimate conclusion of we're all watching each other, you know, and then there, there's potential to, for that to feed into a, a left wing movement on the ground, like in real life. Mm -hmm. But as long as you have this kind of halfway thing, it's not only, you know, enabling a few celebrities still, which are kind of damaging in terms of what it what it is to be left and a broadcaster, but it's also obviously agitating people, and and that creates room for people like Trump to say, you know, you want choices, you're led to believe you can have choices. I'll give you a choice. You can build a wall, you know. Mm -hmm. This is where the right wing populists are kind of, you know, they're jumping in on people's frustrations at being, you know, offered everything and not getting there, which is what Walter Benjamin said in the 30s. Like people, you know, they're seeing all this stuff. They can have like you know, prints of artworks, they can see all this wealth and they want part of that wealth. So the Nazis kind of distracted them saying, you want that? We can go and get that by invading Russia, you know, living right. space in the East. We can have alter property relations if we have wars. Um, and you're getting that a lot in the rhetoric today, not so much the wars, but scapegoating of foreigners and things as a means of distracting people from, you know, their their rightful claim to the wealth that's being dangled in front of them constantly um yeah i mean that's definitely true and i think i think one of the things i worry about with COVID is it i thought 
I thought for a brief second last year that we might start seeing the decline of some of that because like in like with the Nazis, um, they can't deliver. They can't deliver their counterpart promise either. But in a way, we keep on actually buying them time by by defeating them temporarily, but not ultimately, and then not being able to deliver on promises and then they can swoop back up a new round. Might not you know, in the United States, we're obsessed with Trump coming back, but I, looking at the conservative straw polls and stuff, I don't think it's going to be Trump. I think it's going to be another figure. Um, and it's probably not one that we see because most of us didn't see Trump either. Like it was, that was too much of a farce. It had been kind of a running joke in the United States for like 10, 15 years, but no one actually believed he'd do it. Then he did. Um, and similarly, I think we're not going to see whatever the next wave of right-wing populism really is. But it, I think it's coming. I mean, um, given given the Afghanistan debacle uh, um, and the way the media has responded to it, which they seem to be wanting to Jimmy Carter, Joe Biden now, which is a very weird and fast shift, um, you you may actually have a situation where um, we start seeing a bunch of one-term presidents. I was talking about this online today, and I don't know what that means. Or maybe maybe it doesn't happen like that's hard to say. But like um, the right-wing forces that we just fought do seem to have been more or less defeated and and uh, retreating over to pure unreality here in the United States. But the conditions that created them and thus the creations that can rapidly create something else are all still here and getting worse. So it's, it's hard. It, it's hard to say what's going to happen right now. I, I like, um, you know, um, and I think the left has not the left in America um, has not known how to respond to the idea of like how to how to handle this with the sh the the opinion changing about the Democrats, for example, kind of very quickly, day to day, you know, flapping all over the place as far as popular opinion, um, and with various different social classes seeming to change their mood very fast, um, and you know. Um, I think what you're saying here is we, 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 if we don't engage, um, one of what you're saying here, if we don't engage with politics as it is, we actually will be blindsided by this. I, it, like, and I think we kind of were with Corbin and, and, and Bernie, if we're honest, not that there wasn't real organic mass sympathy and support for both those people, but that we took that to be more than it really was because we were in our own discourse communities and not really dealing with everything going on outside of them. I mean, and in Bernie's case, I mean, it wasn't as, as, as decisively disastrous as with Curb and Corbin, but it actually was a decline in popularity. Like the left in America thought Bernie was more popular and the actual vote share was less. Um, and, and they just, had no idea. I, mean, I knew people who just got into massive depressions and and couldn't even function after that. Um, yeah, but it, it was a it was a crushing blow with Corbyn as well because he'd done quite well in 2017. Mm -hmm. There was an election against Theresa May, and actually Johnson was doing terribly in a run up to the election between Johnson and Corbyn. He he couldn't get anything through Parliament, and actually he didn't have the even the majority to call an election. But Corbyn felt that you had to go to an election eventually. Um, so he did it and and he got crushed. And I don't know really why that happened, but there was a lot of um, anti-Corbyn bias in the media. Uh, but yeah, it was, I mean, it was like the most left manifesto since just after World War II in Britain. And it got like 13 million votes or something. Um, it got more votes than, than I think Blair got in his last election. Mm-hmm. Um, and an Ed Miliband, who was a, a former leader of the Labour Party. Um, so positivity, but, you know, still we, we didn't win, and now we're screwed for a long time, I think, in Britain. So 
yeah, there's a there's this kind of feeling of doom. But I think the thing is, I, I do say this in the in the book, uh, the meaning of Mark Fisher. We lack a narrative that you know, mm -hmm. there's now the possibility to to construct a grand narrative online, like QAnon, which fed into. I will, you know, I would say Trump's success, but he lost. But still, you know, well, the, he lost, but he lose lost that badly. Yeah, he didn't lose nearly as badly as opinion polls and everything else would have indicated that he would have. It was a much yeah. closer fight than one would have thought. But it's, you know, the left kind of grappling around saying, how are we going to match these narratives when the narratives are as ridiculous as they are coming from mm -hmm. the right? And we have the narrative like, look, you're going to be the first country to establish egalitarianism, you know, in all its forms, and then lead the world to establish it. Or you're going to, together with other countries, you're going to lead the world to establish an equal community, non-patriarchal as well. Wouldn't that be a great narrative? How come we can't sell that narrative? You know, that's the narrative. But the thing is, we're never trying to sell that narrative. That narrative never really comes up. I mean, I guess Sanders does say things a bit like that. Um, but he's not really allowed to, you know, it's not really allowed to be developed. Right. Um, but, you know, but QAnon is not allowed either. No one's allowed to spread QAnon, really. I mean, it wasn't illegal and it probably shouldn't be illegal. But that wasn't a narrative that Trump was allowed to get up and talk about. He did kind of play into it a couple you of times. You could only hint at it, but yeah, but he couldn't actually endorse it. Yeah, I mean, so can't we like make a narrative as well? Can't we grow up that basically communist narrative somewhere? But it seems we can't, and it's that's kind of frustrating because, you know, all, as, as much as we're trying to do it through podcasts and memes and stuff, that's not how QAnon happens. These things are always totally unexpected. They come from unexpected places. Um, but they come organically, and that's possibly because it's actually a archetype growing up, like with the memes of 2016, the alt-right. There's something in the psyche which is emerging again and again, and it's not the left vision that's emerging. It's something else. This gets kind of Jungian. Um, but, yeah, whatever makes people like develop these racial narratives periodically, uh, return to swastikas and whatever, and 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 the idea that the left are all devil worshippers, you know, whatever that is, that's not playing in our favour. We're not we're not ha we're not having an equivalent narrative emerge, you know, because this stuff must be archetypal to an extent because it's absolutely ridiculous and, and bad. Mm. But people feel they need to kind of, you know, get this stuff out every so often. Why is that stuff emerging? Like you know, which has a lot of parallels with um, the kind of narratives around QAnon have a lot of parallels with stuff emerging prior to Hitler being elected and during the 1930s up to when he kind of committed his most heinous crimes or the regime did. Um, like this stuff is re it's literally re-emerging. It's like it was suppressed and it's re-emerging. We, you know, why don't we have the left hypothesis being suppressed and re-emerging in the same way? Oh, no, it is being suppressed, but what other, why is it not re-emerging and what can we do to make it re-emerge? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think maybe, you know, for, for as much as cultural politics have been overplayed uh, on the left for a long time, particularly the liberal left more than the Marxist one, um, we do have to construct a narrative around this and be able to communicate that narrative clearly. And what's interesting to me, if you look at the what build up to the Bernie moment, Someone asked me how Bernie came to being the other day, and I, I attributed some of it to his base building in Vermont in the 80s and proving that he could turn a, a state that was pretty conservative, actually, into a, a pretty, um, if not left, at least progressive labor liberal uh, state um, and can keep it that way. Uh, but I also was thinking about how even though I had issues with the Occupy narrative and it's like faux populism and this, that, and the other, that really did seed a way for us to talk about class and, and race and gender, and maybe even tie them all back together again in a way that the academic left of the past 20 years had not been able to do. Similarly, with these protests around Black Lives Matter, they led to an ability to talk about race in a way that was unfortunately totally recuperatable by liberals, but at least we had it, right? And they would, and the fact that they wanted to recuperate it was a change. Um, um, and, and yet, you know, during, since, uh, since Bernie too, even before COVID, you got the feeling that 
we lost the ability to spin this narrative again and that we were heading like i feel like the american left if it's not careful is going to have a lot of media personalities but its actual practical effect is going to be like what happened in the 70s um in the united states where you know the last time we had a, a build up like this and a dispersal like this and that's um that's worrying that's very worrying and you you mentioned about this kind of unconscious about it it does seem like a repetition compulsion in a way that we feel like we have to do like we have to redo the new left without realizing that's what we're doing until we've already done it and it's going to maybe in the same way um and um you know i think there's a lot of anxiety of influence there too but anyway, I, I know that you need to get about your day, so I'm going to give you the final point. Um, if you were asking a left to start considering how it was to talk to the world, what do you think it should? What What do you think its simple message should be? It we mean its message or its memes or its memes. Let's 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 stick to, let's stick to your specialty. Its memes. What should its memes be? Um. I think that I actually am very Adornian here. I think we need to embrace abstraction to some level. I think we need to get a bit crazy and wild. And it's been, it's been happening with movements like Vaporwave, some kind of uh, nascent acid communist movement. And, of course, the book uh, we've been talking about that points to the memeing of Mark Fisher goes into to Fisher talking about acid communism I can't, I've been using acid left, and actually in the book I tend to say acid left because there were like there was an acid Corbynism movement as well. I don't want to alienate people who are frightened of the word communism. That's a whole different debate I can't get into now either. Mm -hmm. But okay, I, people who are communists and socialists and social democrat can all come on board. But what acid communism basically is 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 growing up a counterculture comparable to the counterculture of the sixties and seventies, and the way Fisher kind of blends that with some talk about Herbert Marcuse implies an embrace of abstraction psychedelia surrealism kind of more far out art forms that can disrupt the narrative because maybe if nothing's making sense we need to kind of throw everything in the air and i think that might be more useful than where you get left when people say okay so the alt-right are using swastikas we should be using the hammer and the sickle or pictures of stalin okay i mean i always piss people off with this but I think Adorno here is right that we risk when we make images which are strongly confrontational, which are saying like, you know, fuck Trump, the horrible expression, okay, but get rid of Trump, um, screw the Nazis, or, you know, instead of how, you know, to, to counter the Nazis and basically to say, um, you know, fuck off Nazi scum, you use the hammer and sickle, you're playing back into kind of a, a, a conflict that, you know, is going to consume our energies without delivering anything. So we need mm -hmm. to kind of go beyond that. And for Adorno, that's why through abstraction, you kind of rise above the the internal conflicts, which mimic the tendency towards control in society. So that's kind of what I hint at in the book. Um, and it's what we talk about a lot with the acid left. So that's what I would do. More abstract memes, more crazy memes, basically. All right. Well, I'd like to thank you for your time, Mike. And that'll be all for